welcome back welcome back we are now on activity 2 security plan so let's jump straight in you need to use the template called security underscore plan dot rtf and remember an rtf file or rtf document is is similar to a word document you can edit this in microsoft word there shouldn't be an issue you need to produce a cybersecurity plan for the computer network using the results of the risk assessment. So whatever you did in activity one, you're going to make use of that information in activity two. You should use a template provided to you. There are several things you must consider. You must use the same threats you found in activity one for activity two. Now we're going to make use of threats and we're going to make use of protection measures as well. I'll get into this. So these are all the headings that you have to use. So for every threat that you have, you're going to find a protection measure. So a way to essentially fix that problem. And these are the headings you're going to be using. So threats addressed by the protection measure. So let's say for argument's sake, I have two threats and I can use one fix to solve both those threats or to get rid of both those threats. I'm going to put that here. So I can say, for example, the threats are um, this threat here and this threat here and this protection measure is going to solve both of these threats. Now, I'm going to give examples of this, especially when I jump over to my Word document. Details of the actions to be taken, reasons for the actions, overview of constraints, overview of legal responsibilities, over, um, overview of usability of the system, and outline cost benefit. And finally, we have test plan. I'm going to go through each of these. So you are advised to spend roughly two and a half hours on uh, this activity. And again, you're supposed to produce a cybersecurity plan for the computer network using the results of the risk assessment. So keep in mind, you must use stuff that you did in activity one, the risk severity matrix, risk, um, the risk assessment table as well. Come up with a plan to help solve the potential problems you found in activity one. Now, nothing is inherently a problem, yet it's a potential problem. Um, there are more obvious threats that can be grouped. I did not do all the threats, meaning that um, I might not have threats in my list from activity one, which I can group together. But if you have threats that you can group together, and I'm going to give an example here, um, you can group those and you can use the same fix to solve both problems. The main router is broadcasting its Wi-Fi signal. It can be attacked and staff and visitor Wi-Fi can be attacked. Now, these two are more or less the same thing, to be fair. But this is the only thing I could think of really quickly because I want to get these videos out um, to make sure that we group them together. So these can be grouped. Uh, this was an oversimplified example, as I've said. Threats can be grouped if they have similar solutions. Uh, the above Wi-Fi being attacked is the similar thing that's going to happen. And we have solutions that can work for both of these. Threats and protection measure. For every threat you have, you will need a protection measure. So for every issue that you found in activity one, you're going to need bare minimum. I would say about one. I would go two or three things to try and solve that problem. A protection measure is simply a way to fix the potential issue or, or the potential problem you found in activity one. So you're trying to protect something. This is a protection measure. Having multiple fixes is recommended as you will need this for activity three. Activity three, you're going to have to justify why you chose this one over that one, so on and so forth. So this is why I said having two or three is a good number so that when you come to do activity three, you have things to compare and reasons to justify why you chose one over the other. Details of actions to be taken. Now, these headings were copied directly from the, the template, which you will be given in the exam as well. We simply give ways in which we can fix, oh, well, that's supposed to be the potential problem. Give ways we can fix the potential problems. Turn off the router's Wi-Fi and staff Wi-Fi. Make them not discoverable. So before I go any further, let me just explain what this means. When you go on your Bluetooth or your Wi-Fi some, sometimes, and you go to add new device or, or search for a Wi-Fi network, if something is not discoverable, I mean, the person who owns it turned it off so that no one else can search for it. So it is not searchable, essentially. So discoverable and searchable mean more or less the same thing. And the other part of this, have only the visitor Wi-Fi discoverable. This simply means the, the Wi-Fi on the main router, I would never, ever, ever personally broadcast that Wi-Fi because if someone accesses that, they have access to the entire system. The staff Wi-Fi don't really need to access it. What my workplace does, I bring my laptop to them, my personal laptop, which I'm using here. They um, install this very tiny program on my laptop, which actually gets my MAC address 
allows me to log into the Wi-Fi network and it saves my MAC address on their system so that only this laptop will work on the Wi-Fi. Now a MAC address, let me quickly go over that as well. A MAC address is also known as a physical address. This is a non-changeable, so you cannot change this address. Whereas IP address, you can change. And in most cases, if you use some, something known as DHCP, right that will change it every single time you jump onto the wi-fi so it depends on who comes home first so let's say you're in a house four people mom dad two kids if dad comes home first he'll probably get let's just use simple numbers for now um zero one that's his ip address right it's probably going to be 192.168.25.01 whatever the case is mom comes home she's going to be zero two son comes home he's the zero three daughter comes home she's zero four so that's what dynamic host means. So it changes as and when it needs to. So here I said, have Wi-Fi access to staff and router limited to MAC addresses. So only physical addresses that are known to the system can access the system. So every single internet capable device in the world has a MAC address, a physical address that tells you that this device is made by this company. This is the name of it. This is the whatever, right? It tells you everything you need to know about this device, internet capabilities. So if you do the MAC address and people cannot change the MAC address, let's say I block a specific MAC address. So again, I'm going to use simple numbers here to try and explain this. This is not how MAC addresses look, but let me just say my MAC address is 29. If I block 29 MAC address, no matter how long, no matter what they do, they can never connect to my network ever, ever again. Because as soon as they try to connect, what I will do, I will look at the MAC address and I will say, hmm, what's your MAC address number? And if your MAC address number is something that's in my database has been blocked, you won't be able to connect. That's a bit long-winded, but my apologies. Reasons for the actions. Give details on why this action is necessary. Why turn off the Wi-Fi on the main router? I've explained that. Why only make the Wi-Fi, um, the visitor Wi-Fi discoverable? Because you don't want the staff Wi-Fi being broadcasted. Because let's just say you're a company, you probably have 100 staff. It's easy enough to add 100 MAC addresses versus you have thousands of customers every day. You don't want visitors to be getting MAC addresses. Just give them visitor Wi-Fi. It's a lot easier for them. We only allow connection via MAC addresses this is a non-changeable address this is fixed it's there's no way to change it so because there's no way to change it this is a unique identifier which we can always use to identify this device maybe not the person because some people share laptops but it's just the easiest way to do it next we have overview of constraints so a constraint is simply the limitations or restrictions we must work with and i've given a, um, a google search link here so when i do share this powerpoint you guys will be able to see this see this as well um i will have a full powerpoint at some point being shared so stay tuned for that i guess speak on the technical constraints and then speak on the financial constraints so don't join them maybe just speak about i don't know two or three technical first and two or three financial and again the constraints we must work with constraints so as an engineer if you think about it or as an it person as a designer i want to make the new samsung galaxy s29 right samsung is not going to give me an unlimited budget and unlimited time they're going to say uh mr king boss we're going to give you i don't know one million pounds right let's just say one million pounds and we're going to give you one year to make the new phone to design it to make it to program it everything and i'm going to say okay so my constraints in this instance would be the money and it would be the time as well so time and money are two of the biggest constraints that people typically have so that's what a constraint is it's simply a limitation or restriction which you must work with uh, here we have overview of constraints again we have technical and we have financial i believe this is given to you on the template but when i get to the template i'll show you guys this anyway so technical the thing you want to do is it technically possible with current technology i want to turn off the wi-fi so it's not discoverable that's 100 percent possible i want to make only the the um the visitor wi-fi discoverable 100 percent possible I want to turn off the Wi-Fi on the main router so it's not searchable, so it's not discoverable, 100% possible. So whatever you're trying to do, is there a technology present that makes it possible? If I said, you know what, I have a VW Golf, I want to make it fly, they're going to be like, oh, well, there's probably not technology to make that happen now. So that was a bit of a weird one, but hopefully that made sense. If it's possible to do with the technology that we have now. Uh, next one for technical, the thing you want to do 
if it is technically possible, so if it is physically possible, if it is feasible to do, are there people in or outside of the company that can be hired to do it? I don't know how to program Android that well. So maybe as a company, I would have to hire someone from outside to come in and do it or just have someone in my company do it. So I simply need to find someone to do it. Is that going to be an issue? More or less, no, I would say. And for financial, how much money and time will it take to get this done? Because money is time, time is money, so on and so forth. That's what I would do for financial. Simply give a few sentences describing uh, the technical nature of this and the financial nature of this in terms of constraints. And again, a constraint is simply a limitation. Overview of legal responsibilities. Now, when it comes to anything legal, I always go to these four acts. These are the only four I can really remember to be fair. And they are Copyright Design and Patents Act, Data Protection Act, Health and Safety Act, and Computer Misuse Act. The main one when dealing with um, computer systems is probably going to be the one, two, and number four. Number three can come into it, but it's not as heavy as the others. No, 100%, if I need to unplug a server and move it to another room, that's, that's a health and safety hazard as well because there's a lot of power going through it, number one. These things are very, very, very heavy. So health and safety can come into it, but it's more going to be one, two, and number four. So if you don't know what these are, please go back and look at these. Please, please, please go back. Number four and number three, sorry, and number four and number two are kind of tied together, but they are separate acts. So you do need to know the basic premise of each one. So please go ahead and research that. Uh, will the fix you want to implement or do, so implement simply means to do. Will the fix you want to implement or do have um, any of the acts to consider? If so, which one? and then explain why. Why do you think it is important that we consider this act? Now, companies have to follow legal obligations. They have to make sure our data is secure. That's the Data Protection Act. They have to make sure that they don't copy from others. That's the Copyright and Designs Act. So um, at my very small YouTube channel, I cannot just go over to Linus Tech Tips or to Unbox Therapy, or I think this guy's name is Mr. Beast or something. I can't just go to their channel take videos that they've made, chop it up and use it as my own. Uh, the Computer Misuse Act, I have to make sure that people within my company are not misusing the computer systems in any way to try and again steal data, so back to Data Protection Act. I have to make sure that there are health and safety procedures in place to make sure that the people doing work in my company for me don't have any hazards. The chair I'm sitting on right now at my workplace is very uncomfortable, it doesn't support my back, I don't have an armrest, so we need to think about all of these acts. An overview of usability of the system. Usability simply, well, normally means how easy it is to use the system. If something is usable, how easy it is to use it, pick it up, learn it very, very quickly. Windows, Linux, Mac OS, typically easy to use because they all have the same close button. They all have the same minimize button, maximize button. They all have icons. So there's this thing called WIMP, W-I-M-P. Windows, icons, menus, and pointers, and most graphical user interfaces, so most GUIs, G-U-I, graphical user interfaces, this is what we as a user interact with on a day-to-day -day basis on our phones, our laptops, our tablets, our TVs, GUIs. And GUIs typically have WIMP being used to, uh, I guess, display stuff to us, so it's very common. Even though I'm not an iPhone user, I can pick up an iPhone and I can notice or recognize that the green phone icon is probably the phone icon. The, um, the, the gray cog icon that looks like a gear system, that's probably going to be settings, so on and so forth. So will the fix you want to implement or do make the system better to use or worse to use in general? That's the question you have to ask yourself. So me making the, the staff Wi-Fi not discoverable, is that going to be better? Yes, it's going to be better. It's going to make it harder for staff to use it because every time a staff has a new phone, a new laptop, a new tablet, they have to go to IT and IT will have to then add their MAC address to the list of allowed addresses. It's, it's a bit annoying, but it keeps the system safe. If it is going to be better, explain how it is going to make it better. If it is going to be worse, explain how it is going to make it worse. If worse, give a brief description explaining why this is a cho uh, why why this choice was still worth it, right? And again, you don't have to go too detailed here. I'll just say one single sentence because I believe in a later section you have to explain why you made the choice you made. So don't go too detailed here. 
And the next one, outline cost benefit. How much do you think it will cost to do the fix? So me turning off the Wi-Fi on the router, it's probably not going to cost me much. I probably only need a network engineer for one hour to do every single thing I need to do here. A network engineer in the UK, I'm going to say maybe uh, 400 pounds a day. Let's just say 400 pounds a day. That's what they earn, right? If I can pay one person 400 pounds a day to make sure my data is secure, make sure no one can hack my system, make sure everything is configured or set up the way it should be, that seems like a very cheap price. Because if I don't do this, again, cost benefit. So the cost of it, and is it beneficial? The cost benefit. If I pay this guy or this lady 400 pounds, they come in and fix my system. And everything works as it should. Nothing gets hacked. No one does anything they're not supposed to. Everyone has the right access, user access control, user access levels. Um, everything is working fine. Versus I have Sing do it. I pay Sing his monthly salary, which works out to maybe 150 a day or 120 a day, whatever it is. Sing does it, does something wrong. People's details get leaked. I get sued by every single person that has their details leaked because I didn't do things the way I was supposed to. And then I am out of business. I digress. Um, so the next one is how much will it cost to not do the fix? Again, I've just showed an example here. Uh, think of the implications of not doing the fix. Again, paying the IT, sorry, not the IT, the network specialist 400 pounds for a single day or two, let's say, versus paying Singh, who simply knows how to use a computer to set up everything. Singh will most likely get some configuration wrong somewhere. Whereas a network engineer, because this is this is a specialist, I'm not saying they won't get, get anything wrong, but it's just less likely that they'll get something wrong. Uh, simply, is it worth it? Is it worth doing this thing? And in my opinion, for a company, most likely, because again, you have people's details. Um, I may, uh, In the diagram, I remember there being servers. I remember there them saying they have trade secrets. I remember them saying clients visit. So you don't want someone getting into your system unauthorized access. And the test plan, it does not need to be particularly detailed as the system is hypothetical. I copied this directly from a previous examiner's report. So don't make your system too detailed. Don't make your test plan too detailed. Just simply describe the tests. Your test, uh, sorry, not your test, you test your solution protection measure. There is a table for this as well. So this is not something you have to do by yourself. I will go over the template in the next video. And that's it. So I'm going to stop here edit this one, post it straight away. And in the next one, I'm going to jump onto this document here, onto the activity two document and show you what you need to do.